Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, my name is Caitlin. I'm a graduate and I've been collaborating on this summit program with the folks from Waterloo, who are kind of dotted in the audience here. Um, I just want to set some sort of like ground rules for the conversation. We're hoping that this isn't, uh, don't think of this as like a panel and audience. We want this to be like an open discussion. It's kind of like why we chairs in this way, and the folks who are here yesterday are a little bit different. Um, in the hopes that we can like, uh, I don't know, just kind of like ideate and, and talk with each other. Uh, that being said, please be like respectful of the other people in the room. We're hoping that you can kind of limit your answers to around two minutes. We're not going to claim you, um, but it would be uh, nice if you could kind of like all of each other's voices be heard uh, in this conversation. And yeah, I think we're gonna, Sherry's gonna kind of give some context for this conversation, what we're having in here, and then we'll let our uh, expert facilitators introduce themselves, and we'll kick these off with a discussion prompt. Thank you, and uh, thank you all everyone for being here. I know it's like relatively early, like crazy, in a crazy art also week, so especially in the shape of time. Uh, I'm Sherry Gu, I'm the founder of Water Music. Uh, we are a music tech research collective and DAO. Um, our flagship outcome consists of um, multi part season reports that explore emerging tech trends in music. So we've published multiple reports on Web3, we've uh, published one on the metaverse, and we're roughly halfway through our current season on um, AI, creative AI, specifically as it relates to music. But of course, we're studying um, a lot of other creative domains, including visual art um, and literature and text, um, which is why I'm especially excited for these discussions we've been um, curating and hosting the production because. It's bringing together, you know, not just musicians, people from multiple domains, encouraging interdisciplinary thinking, breaking down silos uh, between communities and our research study. Uh, definitely a goal of ours, and hopefully this conversation will reflect that. Um, definitely, yeah, encourage you all to like uh, speak up with as long as we respect each other. No, no thought is too dumb, so all complex, and if it wants to be um, as interactive as possible. Um, I think something also that uh, I guess the next interaction and water music in terms of our goal is um, making an emerging tech that's otherwise very complex more accessible to artists and understandable to artists. So I think that's why we're focusing on curation for this round table because it's definitely one of the driving forces of culture at large. We, we'd all agree, like, it's the reason why um, artists bring to any industry and also the like this perception that, um, especially with the inputs of technology, it might like cut off opportunities to a lot of artists, it might be kind of hard to um, decipher like how to navigate with the new curation landscape, especially with things like um, like music streaming services and streaming. Um, I feel like this this entire week, like why we're all here in Miami, is like huge act of curation for better and for worse. So that's one I could bring up that debate. Well, um, so yeah, I'd say like high-level goal is to understand how we can use technology in the creation part um, for good, how we can get around it for good, um, not to make sure that we're going to be able to do a lot of uh, uh, I'd like to hand it over to you all to introduce yourselves, names, a little bit about the voice of Swim Circle. Focusing on uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
and finding the right person where I think conceptually and technically um, there's like a strong message that I hope we can spread on. Um, hi, my name is Peru Yadis. Um, I am a interdisciplinary artist and also um, in my normal job uh, I was working as an SEO consultant. So I go from a background from painting and like later just using the match and twitch and making visuals. A lot of like a lot of my work is about memes and internet culture. Uh, on the other side I'm like also like uh, vertical, so I'm working also with uh, bias and AI. Feminist uh, subjects in my in my artwork. I just to make performance and yeah, I've been working with AI like two years ago. And hi, uh, my name is Anishka Kapoor. I'm Polish. I live in New York, and I I come from like a more traditional uh, conceptual art background, uh, but actually my own background is in philosophy, um, and then uh, Writing and uh, I work mostly with questions around collective intelligence and how forms in society are produced today uh, differently from like they were produced uh, in early societies, you know, like the comparative media to the way in which mythology was created or other forms that were just products of collective intelligence. And uh, I've been, uh, you know, I'm researching a lot and I'm making works about the direction in which we're. Uh, Headed as a species and all these kind of like particular moments, uh, changes in technology and how they are um, influencing the future of labor and and trying to embed it in my works. Also, um, I'm uh, experimenting a lot with like the redistribution of capital and kind of political new forms uh, of production and redistribution, especially through digital means. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Stiles. I'm a poet as well as an artist. Technology did not foreclose the artistic 
at. It simply relocated it. In the age of highly efficient and broadly distributed text image production, where will the creative act now happen? And or where will artistic skills be needed? So the thing is this as a sort of jumping off point, uh, Moises and Fabiola, maybe I can yeah. I'd love to know your thoughts, I guess, that you would focus and work a lot with uh, text image uh, you know, tools, but also you have a, a much wider uh, artistic practice, and I'm sure I'm interested to know sort of how you think about that and where how you're seeing the, the sort of like location of the creative act moving in the practice. Yeah, uh, I guess one thing I always for now I've been like search engines and calculators and when I like kind of put it into this object that's like input output it gives it less of this like uncertainty or like it, it is still a black box but it's not like this mysterious thing that you don't have control over you kind of understand it has limitations and in that way it lets me kind of put in my own uh, just you know perspective on, on the tool so when I think of like where where it's shifting is kind of realizing that the tool has certain limitations and that even as it evolves, you're kind of putting in that other part to, to the tool. Uh, and yeah, so I don't know, it's like demystifying a lot of the tech demos that make it feel like, you know, the singularity is tomorrow. I and mean, it's like, no, that's like, hold back, like, really explore the tool and, and just try to make things that are meaningful outside of a tech demo. Um, well, I I think about creation, and I remember uh, this documentary from David Copley. Um, uh, it was I, I just forgot the name, but it's uh, the Secret Project. I think it's the name, and he makes like this research where he realizes that people like Caravaggio and um, the the guy who made the the painting of the like the girl with the girl. Uh, There are no drawings from Caravaggio before his paintings. So in this research, uh, he finds out that people were using lenses, and it was like concave lenses. So it's just like uh, the way that it was different when the camera obscura that it was using uh, Vermeer. So I think that that like like going from there, and if we still the past, like there's always artists that are working with technology, and they're always maybe faster or you can produce more and also like right now with this image we have like a, a lot of pressure as an artist to create like constantly because you have like instantly art, right? So I think that um, it's like the example of the camera itself, I, I really think that uh, AI uh, right now is a tool and we are starting like, like digging into it because it's very important. Say that is absolutely horrible. Like of, of people that have said that before, that it's just like growing artists for the most part. I think it's but a matter of how the technology evolves and how tools are available for artists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to say that, um, of, of course, the subject of creativity is very important for my work, but from the point of view of how this has uh, the notion of the author, where this idea of individual singular authorship came into being, because I uh, see culture as being a, a fundamentally a network creative process from the beginning of the human civilization. When, I, when you think about author, the notion of the author, this figure of the author, it's essentially something that emerged properly uh, in late 14th century. And it's currently being quite questioned and ultimately that. Um, uh, and not only in, in the arts, any kind of creativity, because you know, for example, uh, to kind of contextualize it a little bit, uh, so already like in science, there is a, a very observable and interesting shift that now Nobel Prizes are given more often to teams of scientists, and not just like one man or a few genius, one of course, a scientist, and not only this Nobel Prizes are given to teams, but they are even given more recently to 
simultaneously to two or three different people that work on the same thing in different places in the world. And this is even more interesting because it's finally somebody's acknowledging that the success in, uh, in science, or for that matter also in the arts, depends not only on this quote unquote genius and abilities, but also what is the kind of you know, economical background, where do people come from. If they are, for example, working at a, you know, Harvard or MIT, or they are working at an obscure university in, I don't know, Bangladesh or, or, or Poland or somewhere else. And, uh, and so, the, the, and so the, the, the idea of who is rewarded or who is being given recognition is already, I'm just giving these examples from, the, from science to kind of broaden this up, but of course the same is true for the arts. And um, like, you know, in my work I'm really thinking specifically about, um, on the other hand, um, the fact how today this question of creativity is really dispersed and how creativity is being harvested from the entire society and essentially well, exploited in various ways. For example, how the uh, ways in which the value of artworks is shaped uh, today by how people are posting images on Instagram and other social media. Uh, it, like I, the way that I, I think about it is how we can subvert this famous quote from Duchamp that um, uh, the viewer completes the artwork. I don't know how many was this, but today the viewer completes the value of the artwork. It really is shifting because you know something can be even in obscurity, but then it's given it being, it's being retweeted or posted on Instagram by viewers who come to see it no matter where it is. It doesn't have to be a prominent uh, institution. Uh, this, so actually the, the spectators, the, the, the viewers, are actively participating in the creation of that of works. And this I think is a major shift. And of course like this kind of uh, crowd creativity that is being harvested and exploited by corporations, governments and so on. And I, I think but I think that it all changes like what the notion of creativity is and the individual creativity. What is individual creativity? And then coming to, to AI, um, I think that um, you know, AI, I mean what is essentially um, AI? I've been having a lot of conversations about it with Kate Crawford, who is a reporter of AI scholar and a friend of mine. And today AI is essentially a collective a ca capture and harvesting and exploitation of collective intelligence. Not only, I mean, how are algorithms trained? How are all this image recognition, uh, machine vision, uh, and, and, and GPT-3 and other algorithms trained? Because they are trained on the output, voluntary output of people working on these crowdsourcing platforms like Mechanical Turk, but they are also trained on all our participation, like all the people uh, who are doing things online are uh, contributing to the algorithms of GPT-3, which are, you know, like mechanical language processing algorithms. So in a way, what is this algorithm? It's a kind of collective intelligence, a capture, some form of exploitation of collective intelligence of an entire society, or at least the parts that are active online. So we also have to kind of understand that, that it's not just an algorithm written by some, someone in one corporation or one group of programmers. No, it's all this labor that is put into it, and, uh, and to a high degree involuntary, and sometimes unaware in most cases. So this is already, so you know, like, I mean, when we kind of perceive what creativity is today, uh, we, I think that we have to obviously abandon the notions of individualism for many other also reasons, ecology, social inequality, and so on. But also, like, uh, you know, we have to think that individual creativity basically is a kind of a myth that was created in the late 14th century and is currently being dismantled. And obviously, Wikipedia is a good example of that, but there are internet memes, I mean, who is the author of these memes? Uh, they are living their own life, they have evolved by like living organisms. And even, the, what is really interesting for me, that even the corporations and governments that do have power and exploit, but they, they, they cannot completely control how memes live. And I think this is kind of one of the interesting things, right? So I think it's kind of Yeah, interesting. no, I really love the way you put that together. There's something really interesting here in that, like, we were talking about like the Nobel Prize and how they're sort of acknowledging this like high of mind collective knowledge and then AI is kind of just the like making explicit of that. It's sort of like these your very your GPT three is very explicitly referencing the you know the, the text that people put on the page, you know? Uh, I think I, I had never like drawn the line before I have a question in a very practical sense. Where is the value that, that should artists expect to be able to make a living creating their art? I mean, this building on the shoulders of giants, the phrase goes, which we know is the case for sure. And I think interestingly in the scientific papers, it's all about citation. 
it's like, you know, the, the greatest honors, like the more times you're cited, like I think about, you know, the funky drummer, it's like the most sampled drum beat of all time. Um, and the analogy there, but in, through the lens of how you've been looking at the world and all the shows, um, yeah, I guess the image of or the uh, barrage of individual authorship, how do you envision value? this a lot through my work and I'm experimenting with um, uh, th this was actually the prompt that I <laughs> submitted yeah. in a way um, and you know um, I am experimenting with redistribution of capital having this in mind you know having in mind the, the fact that uh, you know uh, artists today that are for example able to somehow maintain themselves uh, on the surface do some things are extremely privileged and, uh, and how that there should be more equitable ways of, say, for, for writers, actually. We were actually just talking about this with Brian. Uh, I'm also very, like, to kind of broaden it, but the theme of creativity, you know, uh, something that, that is very important to my heart is how much writers, writing about culture, art in particular, you know, our writers are hugely underpaid. However, writers are the ones that are legitimizing the works of artists. They are, uh, they are, uh, you know, they are co-creators of value. They are really contributing to the value of the works. And yet, most most writers, with some exceptions of very very famous writers, uh, are underpaid. And so, I'm thinking a lot about this, and I've been trying to fold it into some of my works. You know, so some of, some of the works that I've been making. Uh, well, including the piece that is here, unfortunately, only visible after dark, <laughs> but. <laughs> It's you know based on redistribution of capital among uh, other either uh, workers uh, uh, working on crowdsourcing platforms that contribute to people work and then uh, you know actually interestingly like so um, Amazon uh, uh, they remember the IP addresses and the, the mechanical Turk allows for workers to receive bonuses even long after the task has been completed. So, you know, using this, uh, I uh, created this project um, actually together with my uh, my husband John Manik, who is an artist and a writer, where we created drawings that are based on lines drawn by by a mechanical term workers, and each person draws one line, and then it becomes one continuous line. But when the drawing sells, it, the, the funds are distributed uh, easily with just one click among all the participating workers. And I've done similar things with like images of like, you know, for example, people submitting their selfies and then um, kind of a creative self-portrait of all the workers that work online. But I've been thinking about, you know, more complex, how this could be used for philanthropy, for example, you know, to, to use art, because obviously art market has become such a place of generation of like crazy amounts of value, but only for select people. How could we create you know, uh, ways of like redistributing this capital. First of all, um, between artists who are extremely successful, and I'm not, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about artists that are making like millions, millions of dollars. How come the artists that make this so much money, including the artists in the digital realm, are not sharing, are not creating some immediately philanthropic, you know, sharing of this to, to people that need it? In the art world, of course, beyond the art world as well, but um, you know, with other artists, with other, with with writers, and you know, of course, with social movements and other. And I, I was just talking about this this morning um, uh, you know, with a bunch of people um, that uh, you know, during the pandemic, there, there was an interesting example coming from tennis players. I don't know if you're uh, aware of this. So, so uh, you know, not that these people are like. Perfect, and they, they they are perfectly honest, or they are like they have their other problems, you know. But but Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic and and a couple other top tennis players at the beginning of the pandemic, they realized that they are very famous and they are getting money anyway, even if they are not playing. But there are all these other amazing talented players that are unemployed during the pandemic, and they created this fund, and each of them gave, I don't remember, between, I think, $100,000 and a million dollars, and it was the top 10 tennis players that chipped in and created a fund for 1,000 less, lesser known tennis players that would be basically supported so that they just could survive. Because they, um, and I was just kind of shocked that this example, and it probably is flawed, it could be done better, it was only 1,000 people, we can question it, but as an example, this example comes from tennis. 
And this should be done in the, in the arts where it's really most of criticism about exploitation, about, you know, questions of political, social inequality and so on are raised. Tennis is not exactly the most <laughs> critical field. And I was, and even after this happened, you know, nobody picked it up, like, and in the art world. And so I've been, you know, experimenting. I'm, I'm really curious. So my prompt was really, how do you guys, what is your experience, what are your ideas, how this kind of, you know, more equitable, uh, yeah, sharing um, or redistribution of capital could be done? What, what is your... This, this doesn't really have to do with AI, but there's a couple examples that I can think of that are very, very tiny examples, but um, I think are maybe indicative of the way that things could move. So there's one is that I'm thinking of a, um, a gallery in Los Angeles called Epoch Gallery that has a model that's really built on this idea of everyone's part of the collective. And when you are part of a group show there, you are contributing a piece, but then everybody is paid out of uh, the, the total income from that show, and it's kind of distributed, um, you know, with that in mind. So I feel like that's that's also something that I, you know, I think people have sort of picked up in it a little bit, but not replicated it. And I wonder why. But having been in group shows with um, with that gallery, I thought it was a really interesting way of doing it. The other thing is, one of the first projects that I was ever in, um, in, uh, in Web3, the first, one of the first writing projects that really got me excited about the potential for writers on the blockchain was a, um, a project called Ether Poems, where there was a crowdsourced group of poets who were invited to be part of a collective of writers and all contribute you know, a certain number of poems to a collection, so essentially a distributed anthology of poems. And this, again, is not they are related, but it's blockchain related. Um, and we were all part of this collective together, and um, we were on a smart contract together. So every writer who had contributed pieces was part of this contract, so when one thing was sold, everybody benefited from it. So I feel like that, again, is just something that in the grand scheme of things is logistically so simple. I think then it becomes a question of how do you decide who's part of these collectives and who's making those decisions and all that. And I think there's some interesting use cases for artificial intelligence to kind of break beyond the algorithmic patterns that we're all, you know, stuck inside to kind of help curate, help, you know, help find voices, help find um, talents who are not normally, you know, getting curated into things or pulled into um, certain groups. And maybe that's a way to think about some tactical ways to leverage AI and, and make sure that people are getting a fair piece of time. It's interesting like how quickly I feel like in this conversation, uh, like I think on the surface people are like AI and Web3, what do those things have to do with each other? And then so quickly we're like, oh, it's like this creative in or this collective intelligence and then it really lends itself, the conversation really like lends itself so well to this like idea of like collective risk reward or like collective uh, like benefit garnering. And I want to talk, uh, Sasha, with you a little bit more around this idea of like singular authorship because it feels like you're kind of addressing that pretty explicitly in your work. But before that, I want to ask everybody in the audience like where we're all coming to this conversation. Like, would you all identify yourselves as like, artists or like creative maintainers? I, if, maybe like show of hands for artist. Show of hands for like creative maintainer culture worker. Yeah, and then does anyone want to like if you didn't raise your hand for either of those, give like any more fun? I just want to make sure we're kind of all uh, like on the same page, playing with the same deck of cards. If there's any like terms that people aren't familiar with, um, would happen to be yeah, web three, web three, uh -huh. big one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't want to sidetrack the conversation too much from like the, the from the AI conversation, but basically, like Web one was the read phase of the internet. Web two was the read write phase of the internet. So like social media, you could start like writing on the internet. Obviously, those systems got like very very exploited by huge companies. Who, when you write on the internet, you don't own that content necessarily, uh, basically ever. And then so. Then is sort of this emergence of Web3, which I would say we're not quite at, but Web3 is read, write, own. So how do you own the content that you we could I think we could talk for like hours about. I can uh, give it a pretty straight. Like Web3 is like everybody's using one shared database and everybody can see what everybody's writing. And there's a lot of math and like fancy stuff that like allows us to trust what everybody's putting in the shared database. 
and that like breaks it up from like every company normally having their own private database and you're not able to own that data. So from that primitive, you can build up a lot of interesting stuff to where everybody on the shared database knows who contributed to a project and it automatically distributes data within the database. Uh, one more question for the group, and then I don't even yeah, like talk to or ask specific questions to this group of people. Um, so for, I guess regardless of where you're coming from, I'm curious if like one, you've used any creative AI tools in your practice, and two, if like all the things that we've talked about, if that like, uh, I'm curious if that lines up with how you're understanding the, like the role that those tools play. Like, oh, we're all collectively making and generating this art, or is it more like still focused on like your individual output as an artist? I'm just curious like where people are at with that. Or, well, I, I started I started collecting, but uh, when I collect, I really like to understand what's going on in my. Uh, Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. No. You're yeah. Good. So I started collecting, you know, NFTs and stuff, and then I was like really wanted to know what's behind it, and I turned like into generative art, which I liked a lot, and started going through all these like libraries and drawing, and then but then I found out about the AI, and uh, I used like all the you know stable diffusion, mid journey, it's all this like GitHub collapse and blah blah. First trying to understand how it works and then you know it just takes you away. It's finally for people who like basically have imagination but maybe don't have such a strong uh, drawing skills, now we have tools. And that's how basically I'm on the same page as that. Like um, I don't have any artistic abilities so I find that these AI technology to make you really I don't have any technical campaign. Um, if you know how to write and you're really imaginative, that's what I found out that, that AI is kind of me make art with that. Yeah. At first, I, I didn't really I use Dolly, but then I kind of threw away after a while. But then I figured out that if you can really create a prompt, it's exactly what you're trying to make. That you can really so that's why I'm just getting into that AI. It's like NFT democratized the art collection, yeah. right? So before that, like, we were like these galleries and really rich guys who were able to who collect for millions. NFT made it happen that you can collect, well, for millions if you want to, but you know you can go, you can find any anything like for your wallet. So same kind of with these popular AI tools. Before that, it was like for the chosen one, you know, for the nerd engineers and. Sorry if I like finding anyone, but you know, for, for the guys who like really digging into data and stuff and like coding, now with all these open source uh, uh, platforms, it, like it's getting more like democratized. Maybe the quality of art sometimes is not that good, but the purpose again for this sometimes a lot of people use it just you know for like homemade I don't know pictures of my wife or whatever, right? So not, not like well that's what I'm doing a lot and my friends like just love it when I like you take photos, you train this stability diffusion model and you made all these like different images of the person and they just wow. So like you know, but at the same time there are I think a lot of uh, tech guys, IT guy like a lot of like more like engineering uh, guys now getting into it. AI with like really interesting concept how to transform data into the art. It, it seems like a, the way photography was democratized with the phone, same thing seems to be for art, uh, digital art especially, uh, seems to be the way AI has opened this door to now democratizing digital art for anybody. And, uh, and I think it is going to develop to the point where you could really, you know, say one thing and going to be pretty precise based on, you know, how many constraints we can yeah. form on. If you uh, have imagination, no tools and can direct. Right? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's, if art is actually healing to the artist that is making it, now we can all access that healing. So there is something really great there. As we continue with the role, I guess, like, curation will play even in, like, prop generation. Um, I'm a design researcher, so I think it's always, um, it's cool seeing like what people do. Like, I'm not a great visual designer. It takes me a lot longer to get there than a lot of people. Um, but I think it's been really cool to see people who are able to kind of like, like you know, curate and train their prompts and like learn from that and like to develop something that is more of their own style than like the tool they're using. So that's kind of like a, a next, I don't know, it's like a next level of curation skill is like what are like what are those keywords? How do you kind of get that the same way you used to like for anything else? Kind of further to that, I feel like. 
what I've played around with, uh, you know, art, AI generation, it allows me to be very iterative so I can quickly like learn what works and what I like and what I don't. And it allows me to get a lot more specific, um, which I feel like other times when I've done other as a non-artist who likes to dabble in the arts, every now and then I could, you know, lose steam or get frustrated when like it doesn't look exactly how I want it and then it's like, okay, we're well, going to have to start over or, or something like that. Um, just as a non-artist who's dabbling. Um, and it's quite fun. If I may add, also like this, this AI tools, they bring so much, you know, merging different uh, different ideas and different spheres and do it really fast. So I'm working with one of like really traditional artists. She's quite famous. She's like award-winning like portrait portraitist. I don't know how to say that. But now she uses AI to generate models for her. Because it's always the problem for her to find model and then you know model has to see it like in hours like this and different angles. And when I introduce her to like mid journeys and then they can she can take like the same seat and generate this model and then generate like a little bit different variation. She was like, oh my god. So you know all this kind of stuff. And for me personally I work a lot with artists. Just go to like mid journey and generate like a sketch of what I want from them. Now suddenly we're speaking the same language. It helps like it's a question of curating. It helps, you know, to, to get to the common grounds to, to the vision. Because before that I was explaining, yeah, you know what I want this there and this there. And now you can use these tools and uh, just present it to the artist and he's like, oh okay, I got it. Yeah, I think there's something interesting there and yeah, Sasha, I want to bring it back to you around like if you could talk a little bit about I know you've like really experimented with like different like models and you have like a specific model that's trained on your voice right and like I, I think again to kind of tie it back to this conversation it was starting to bubble up there around like singular authorship it's sort of like the myth of authorship um i'm interested if you could kind of give a little bit more context from your practice yeah for sure um i also just wanted to say this as a sign that's what we were just discussing i i find it super interesting that we're talking so much about like the applications of these tools like for art like making you know using these tools like the journey and stuff to make art but I think a lot, again, from my perspective as a writer, a lot of what writing tools, writing AI tools are useful for is not necessarily creating like great literature. A lot of it is like, how can you express yourself better? How can you write an email really well? Or how can you like create a white paper that's like super clear? And I just I think a lot about that too with the art side. It's like, you know, not to create something that necessarily its function is taking in a museum, but like to enable someone to be able to express something to be able to capture their imagination in a way they've never been able to before. Like putting, articulating something visual through an AI in that way I think is like utterly mind-boggling and just revelatory. So I think about it that way, not necessarily in terms of like making, making AI art too, but in terms of authorship, um, yes. So I guess a little bit of background is that, um, like I said before, I come from you know, I'm a language and literature person. I'm not a technologist. I'm not a coder, or you know, I, I'm not um, trained in AI in that way. But um, but I've gotten really, really interested in the relationship between language, between poetry in particular, and and technologies, and the relationship and the resonances that I see between the way that writers work and the way that the writer's imagination. Um, you know, get sparked when ideas collide with each other and the way that that happens in intelligent systems. Um, and I'm seeing that like, as I work more and more hands-on with, with different AI um, programs, with different large language models, with different um, research projects, I see more and more similarities between the way that these models work and the way that ideas are created and the way that inspiration happens and how that happens in my own mind. And so I feel like for me, I've been continually kind of breaking down this idea that um, that my human, you know, um, author self is creative and the machine is doing something for me. Like, and I'm starting to see that distance between the two really shrinking. And maybe to kind of illustrate that a little bit, like when I started writing with these AI language tools, um, I guess in like 2018. I again was coming from this very traditional um, language background. I was taking these very traditional poetry workshops, and I would start, you know, 
playing, playing with these tools, writing poems, and then bringing the poems into workshop. And every single person in the workshop would look at me and say, that's cheating. Like, what you're doing is not writing. That, you know, you're either being lazy or you don't have your own ideas, and like, this isn't poetry, and this isn't actually, like, creative writing. It's not creative writing. So, you know, I've been, like, battling with that for a long time, thinking a lot about how to kind of push back against that. And, you know, I, I think one of the ways that I've kind of boiled it down and then I like to begin to engage in a conversation about that is exactly what we've been saying, that we're all building on systems that have already been built different ways. And like I as a writer, I'm not inventing language every time I speak or write something. I'm not inventing an alphabet. I'm not creating grammar from scratch. I'm using systems that have been designed and that are, we're iterating on them and we're like adding layers and layers to them as we go. But I, I, can, I can write the poems that I write because there's all this work that's already been done and I can build on that. And I, I feel like, you know, when you start to think about that and, and put AI in the context of all these other inventions that we're using every time, you know, we, we write a novel or something, it starts to make more sense that you can add a tool like AI and it could enable, you know, or unlock even greater um, realms of creativity than, than what we have now. So rather than look at it as limiting or as cheating or as outsourcing, it's like, okay, now that we've, you know, up level to this point, now what can we start to express? Um, so, uh, yeah. I, I think on what you're saying there is like, what can you start to express after you've used the AI? Like that's where art yeah. is moving towards. Yeah. It's like that which you can't just press a button and, and like make a work of art, you know, and submit. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like maybe, maybe language and maybe art are going to start looking very different. Um, <laughs> and, and, Back to the like uh, credit slash like community aspect. Um, I just want to mention a bottle that's a DAO that's with AI, and they do these like auctions, and people create works. I think maybe people can submit, and then they get voted on which one actually gets um, sold, and then that gets redistributed to the DAO. So again, like AI DAOs is something that like they did it first, I believe, and will be more of. And then also from like a technical standpoint, like the royalty system that could be ingrained in the model, uh, at least in some, you know, marketplace or protocol where you, if you were citing a living or even a dead artist, and there could be some attribution back to, after sold, like some percentage can go back to the people who make the model, the, you know, living artist, the foundation that supports the dead artist or something like, I don't, that seems okay to me. Like, I just don't, like if, if they if it was ingrained in the technology, it'd be a lot easier um, than trying to figure it out on your own. But if we could move towards some kind of smart royalty system that could kind of calculate that for you, that'd be, that's like, I'm, I'm still hopeful that like on the AI ethics side, there could be a solution. Because I'm kind of twisted a, a little bit, you know, I was also thinking about the twisted version of this, what these tools could enable. And um, uh, I did this project, um, where um, I realized that uh, now with the ability to train, uh, yeah, like any of these tools on someone else's work, somebody else, not me, could make my work and maybe maybe even drive, you know, profits from it. So before this happens, I mean, maybe this will never happen, but uh, but I, uh, I I kind of anticipated this and I basically um, uh, trained. Um, uh, both, uh, I mean, GPT-3 uh, and GPT-2, because it was actually interesting to compare, and I'm curious what your experiences was that, on, because, uh, you know, I make conceptual art, I, the, 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 and each work the, uh, operates with a very different uh, technique, technology, medium, the, uh, the only thing maybe that they have in common is that the, 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 the certain set of issues that I'm interested in, but, uh, so it, won't, it wouldn't be possible to train an AI, for example, on the way that my works look, even though I'm a visual artist, but because my works are conceptual, I uh, trained the GPT-3 and GPT-2 on the descriptions of these works and some of the essays that I wrote that in relation to my work. And then basically this produced descriptions of new conceptual works that I haven't authored 
And then, then I gave it to a company, like a hologram company that produces holograms of products, like you know, Nike sneakers or uh, Coca-Cola or something. And they created a hologram pre uh, presenting some, uh, as like a sequence of, of visualizations of some of these works that were kind of like adjacent possible of what my work is. So they are almost, you know, something that maybe my unconscious has rejected, but I can imagine I could have made this. So, of course, on the creative side, I could have used it, and it was a kind of an inspiration for me to think about it. Oh, this is interesting. I, I, I thought about this and this, but how about this and this and this configuration, yeah. right? I didn't think about it, but this is was the, within the adjacent possible, within the margin of error of what, but I haven't thought about it. But the kind of, you know, the twisted side of it that somebody else could think about it, and they could train an AI on what I do. And, of course, this is even much easier, and it has been done for visual, artists that are strictly visual, that just work with images, paintings, drawings, or any graphic. And it has been done, and I think as, as far as I know, there are even some low suits already that are happening about that, right? People generating, and, and I know that now the new, visual, the new version of, I don't know, stable diffusion is, um, uh, that it does not include the possibility of, there's something that's restricted. Creating works in, in the style of, is uh, to some degree limited. You probably guys know more about this, and this is for a reason because there's a question of value. Who's going to draw profits? You know, if you're going to produce a work in a style of Picasso or someone, you know, somebody who's not yet in the public domain, what's going to happen with that? So, um, so you know, so I was thinking like, yeah, like this is, of course, it's a tool, but it's a pharmaco. It can very easily be turned into a weapon, right? Can I ask a question to you? Is there a moment? in your process, and I know you work with all different mediums, so I think it would be interesting, where you're like, I haven't created anything yet. Like, as a musician, like if I pull a loop from Splice, and I didn't make that loop at all, and I just put it in my DAW and I'm listening to it, I don't consider myself to have created anything yet. Maybe, even if I put a little drum beat, I'm like, uh, you know, probably human authorship has not like entered the building yet. Um, do you feel when you use these tools, like, is there a similar moment, or like, is there a use of these tools at which point you would actually say to somebody, "Sorry, you haven't created anything." Here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would say that I would like with Dali, I like I really created like a lot of like a lot of images, but I am not like comfortable saying like everything is just like art, right? It's just like you have a creating process, but before I was making uh, models with style and too, so like a lot of faces and like, just like a tackles and you know, like uh, Infinite Tackle was one of my NFTs, so it's just like I just made like a, a model and I just scraped data from Instagram and I just trained in tackles, right? And I would not like bint or post all of those images to say, oh yeah, this is my work of art. But it's just like, like from the model that I trained, then I can, I, like I can have one output that I really like, and that's the only thing that is going to be like my art. And also, I, I, I am in, like in AI ethics maybe because I'm also uh, as an SEO consultant. You work a lot with like data and statistics and kind so it's just like I find very interesting to grab the data from the internet, not from artists, but um, basically I am very focused in surveillance uh, capitalism and facial recognition in my, my work also. So I am very curious about how uh, uh, AI, like machine learning models can rep like replicate uh, faces. So I have this grant in Mexico and um, I trained a model of, of faces of women victim of fe femicide, and um, it was it was hard because you see all of these women, and I just grabbed the, like the pictures from like when they were alive from Instagram, and you see like the selfies, and you see like that they're happy and like they're smiling, and then I trained the model because one of my points was like. This is not a serial killer. Like this is like a disease that is happening, and like women are like really uh, victims, and it's just like you don't know who like who are killing them because justice in Mexico is, is just shit, and it's just like so. It's just like 
like the idea of what my my artwork is like the future victims that are going to be like 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 from this data that I that I use. So one of the things that I got from my tutors, uh, they told me like, oh, but you have to make the data set public. And I was just like, no, because that's super disrespectful. Like I, I don't, like I know that it's disrespectful that I took the images, but like the data set is not going to be public. Like the only thing that is gonna be public is the output, like the videos of the generated traces, but also like giving like back to the community, like is there any, like uh, organizations, like feminist organizations, or women that are interested in working with the pico file of the model, and like I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give it like the model, like so they can use it to, I don't know, to make art or research or whatever. Like maybe this is, can be like a little stone for something. And I also use Dali to make, uh, to complement the piece. Um, I asked some friends to uh, tell me situations where they were living in violence and or they were like about to be in like some kind of dangerous situation and like a lot of like because you you see girls and like I'm sorry that I, I'm, I have a point but you see girls that are uh, that they leave things that you live but they are killed like and they're murdered and then with those stories that I, I could be it could be me and then I generated like the like the story that they told me in Dali to just like because you you can hear a story, but then if you see like how an AI created and like a, a, an image from this story that is like super horrible and like uh, I don't know like I, I've shown this piece to uh, men like most mostly men to see what's their reaction and. For some reason, it seems like I, I was successful. It's something that it touches them because one thing is to like, see the news or something, but like through the testimonies and like the visualis visualization through AI, like you can like make people like question themselves like about a certain topic with like data that yeah like unethical data that I got and like uh, text to image, but like you can do something meaningful with the data or like the text to image that you're working with. Like it's not everything is a work of art, but it's like it could be meaningful, like how you are using it. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, I guess one thing is I, I'm, I'm more likely to not make art with AI, but I'm gonna make more of it. So like. I just think about it as like you're you're just checking your phone or you're you're making a tweet you're um, you're cooking like AI art is closer to cooking in a way maybe it's not the best food but you know you made like an experience and then like so you'll get better at kind of curating and deciding what what is that message or taste or aesthetic that you're like no this this is art to me and this isn't and I think a lot of us will get better at figuring that out and we'll get used to I mean we're already consuming millions of images but we will consume much more and then we'll own or, or generate we will ourselves generate many more so like I just thinking like everyone will have you know uh, 3,000 images they've made like even you know your like your cousins or somebody that doesn't make art like they'll have access to this visual communication space and well, we can all connect. Somebody mentioned that, like, I think it was you that you said that you could better communicate with your designer or artist because you were able to be in that language level. So, right, it's like it's not art, it's we're just activating a new communication tunnel uh, with the tool. I think one, one reason why this is so such a juicy question is because there's so many different, you know, definitions of what art is and thinking about, you know, Okay, let me give some examples. Like, I'm a huge fan of Elaine Sturgeon, and I love appropriation art. Like, I, I think, I think, I tend towards conceptual um, art as kind of my jam, and like, I, you know, if you look at a piece that Elaine Sturgeon created, she's literally taking a piece that someone else has already made and is recontextualizing it as her work and presenting it. And I think maybe there's something similar to be said for some use cases for creative AI, and, and again, it totally depends on how you're it and you know the, the framework that you're building around it and your intention. Like 
like there's something about your intention or your purpose in using the tools in a certain way. So I feel like just the way that's the, that's the case with human art too. There's a lot of really terrible, rote, formulaic human art that is just replicating things that we see. There's a lot of terrible poetry where people are just mimicking styles and voices and cadences. And it may sound like poetry, but it's not like coming from some pure, you know, personal intention in the way that we think of when we think about poetry. And I think it's the same thing with AI to some extent. Um, when I started using uh, large language models, I was using GPT-2 in the very beginning. And like I said, I'm not a coder by, um, by background, so I was using an off-the-shelf version just via um, an interface called Talk to Transformer. And I wasn't, you know, um, customizing any way and it was this very simple interface that anybody on the internet had access to and you could go to it and all you needed to do was type in a prompt and then hit um, the button that said complete or generate and it would give you your output so it was you know no no barrier to entry on that at all and even so there were so many possible outcomes and so many ways to use it it's like giving someone a pencil and like expecting that every time they go to it it's going to have a recognizable outcome and the, one of the first poems that I ever wrote using that, um, that template or that interface was a poem that basically used the same input over and over and over again verbatim, not changing anything, to see how the output would change over time and to kind of use those outputs as pieces of found poetry or as like a material to kind of show that, you know, you can have the same tool, you can have these same systems, but the, like, you know, there's, there's context, there's time, there's, um, you know, there's an accretion of what's already been put into the system that affects the output, just the way that you know, you're engaging in a conversation and that changes how you might respond to a question. So I feel like there's all these um, nuances to how you can use it and like what you're using it for and again what the framework is for that probably has an impact on, on, on your question. So I mean there can be really great art that you, know, you take that sample and you, you, you use it in some really way or you could take it and use it in some lazy way and maybe that's not art. So. I discovered, for example, um uh, I discovered two things with these tools was 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 AI. Um, uh, one uh, uh, one positive and one more more, more negative. So um, uh, I actually, when I was experimenting with GPT-2 and GPT-3, I realized that GPT-2 was more creative for me because uh, uh, um, because there are more glitches in it. And I think that there's some kind of problem because these tools are, what is the goal? I mean, this, obviously these tools are not necessarily invented only to be used for artists. There are other applications, governmental, corporate, corporate uh, uh, goals, and this is probably, this is even why this is, these things are military, that are, this is why these this areas are being, um, you know, explored. And, and so the, somehow the goal of these tools in a certain way is to be very accurate, to present, you know, to create text that can mimic a text written by someone and it's identical, uh, or to create an image that is most uh, looks like something. But, but so the glitches are something that uh, ideally should be eliminated. I mean, the way that this, this, these programs are, are conceived and funded, especially funded a lot of them by corporations uh, or governments. But, uh, but in fact, the glitches and errors is what drives any kind of evolution, including evolution in biology, but also creative you know, uh, process. So for example, you know, like with GPT-3, I had a lot of interesting associations and everything, but, but I didn't have the kind of glitches that I discovered with GPT-2. And what happened with GPT-2 that it, um, it uh, helped me to create uh, neologisms that, that were like really proper neologisms that I I was really shocked to discover it because because the, uh, the, the kind of glitch that that allowed for that and I, I'm curious what were your experiences with this but 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 this knowledge is specifically happened with GPT two and GPT three was just like more accurate more sounded like what I've already written and, and and but you cannot just you know copying and representation is not really the you know this is not how creative process is happening and then uh, kind of drawing more on this you know like. I have this question or, or fear, and I've talked to a number of creative technologists and, and thinkers of, um, of AI, that there, there is this kind of um, danger in all these tools, uh, the machine vision tools, and um, yeah, uh, 
like like the journey and, and Dali and so on, to a certain homogenization that we think it's endless, that this this creativity is endless, anything can be produced. But that is actually not true because the data set is limited, even though it's huge. And that if you spend more, I mean, anybody who has spent more time with these tools knows at a certain point that there is certain repeatability. It repeats, yeah, yeah, yeah. repetition, yeah. you know, that these things uh, are to, in a very, very large uh, um, uh, sense generic at some point, right? And that this is why for me this can be used perfectly, what you were talking about as a sketch tool, as a way of uh, facilitating communication, uh, it's perfect and it's actually extremely useful. But I would stop like uh, one uh, step short uh, before saying that these are the creative tools for inventing new artistic content, like what you were saying. It's, it's, I, I think this less and less. Just because, you know, like you can even see where, because what is the data set for images that are scraped for, to train these algorithms? I'm sure it's happened to you. Sometimes you can see a watermark in some of them. Yeah. And this is because there are a lot of corporate images there. This, this tells you something. These images that are feeding, that are training these algorithms were not created by artists. I mean, some of them were, but it's a very small subset. Uh, it's a fraction of these images. Most of them are corporate images. And this has to obviously, you know, give you an idea of what kind of creativity can be born out of the data set that is largely corporate content. Uh, we, we will never know how this, you know, happens within the black box of, the, of, of this. But, but, but of course, you know, it's, uh, I think that we have to reflect on this as well. So I'm very, you know, for me as a tool, yes, but as a, you know, like just playing something creative, only in a very critical and subversive way that how perhaps it cannot really be fully creative and we have to twist it and we have to, yeah. Just, yeah, no, I agree with that. But just to like also throw maybe like a slight provocation in, it's funny to me to also think about the things that we think of as signifying like the ultimate masterpieces of the creative human imagination. Some of them were, like a lot of things were commissioned by patrons and they were developed with someone specifically in mind. You know, Shakespeare is canon, but like Shakespeare was writing for very particular audiences to please them and create entertainment. And so I think there's an also something interesting about thinking thinking about that maybe to some extent. And like, yes, thinking about the extent to which our collective consciousness is informed by and shaped by and influenced by these commercial um, these commercial images and commercial um, representations. So yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. I was, I was going to also say that, um, I meant to say this before and I forgot, but one of, the, one of the things that I think has been helpful for me as someone who comes from a literary background to think about the vastness of these systems and to think about kind of what they represent is, you know, we talk in literature about, cano uh, about canonical texts and we think about, you know, um, books or poems that everyone knows and there are things that are just touched so like everybody knows Happy Birthday or everybody knows Hamlet and they just become things that are embedded in us and like you can, you know, you're, you're, we're repeating idioms that we don't even know are from Shakespeare, but they're from Shakespeare. And I think to some extent, I've come to view a lot of these models, or a lot of the training data that goes into them, and to some extent as being that kind of canon. Um, and, you know, it's for better or for worse, it's representing not just things that we consider literature or art or whatever, but it's all the things that kind of influence um, all modes of expression and interaction and communication in that way. So yeah, again, like for me, there's something again really interesting about thinking about it not just as this technical, this idea of a training data set sounds so intimidating. It's not that different from, you know, from these collective, you know, corpuses that we all have in our head when it comes to cultural material as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something that actually you and I were talking about a few weeks ago around this, like, the sort of, I feel like, like lurking in the shadows is that, like, all of these companies are, like, VC-funded companies, Elon Musk-funded companies, like, the, 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 the intention of, like, of these companies is, is to make money. I know it's something that you all in Warner Music are, like, exploring around, like, sort of, like, the business models of AI tools, like, do these things have, have business models and... And then if they do have business models, how does that like affect what's coming out of it? And I think there's like there's so much uh, 
sort of like critical mass conversation around like the way that AI models can uh, perpetuate bias, which is like what 100% like valid and real. Um, and I I appreciate you kind of both uh, like referencing re like referencing that like there is I I actually hadn't experienced that like. Uh, that you mentioned with the watermark, but I think that that's so, that's so, so telling. And I mean, I'm curious if like anybody from the water music crew, or I, really anybody could like, uh, we were sort of talking about how it feels like with the, like in the visual art world, it feels like a lot of the kind of uh, money in the space is flowing from like private equity or, or like big corporations, but that in, uh, that in music right now, it still feels like it's kind of like, conceptual or something and there's more like academic research and academic and public funds going into uh, the research on the music side. Have you guys like found, have you kind of like pulled on that thread a little bit in your yeah, research? Yeah, I can speak a little bit yeah, to that yeah. and I also want to like pose a question to, also hello, thanks for joining. <laughs> How are we doing on time though? Uh, I was going to say we have about 10 to 15 more minutes for this portion of the oh. conversation <laughs> and then yeah, and then uh, we'll take like a little bit of a break, and then I want to come back and sort of ask this group uh, for like the final like half hour, twenty minutes of this conversation. Like, given the context of this conversation, what are things you want uh, to see investigated further and talked about more? So that's kind of how we'll end things. But yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think how to make this concise. The frame is the question. So I guess there are two things. One. Um, so at Water Music, we have like a business model thread for our season on Creative AI, our research thread. Um, I've been very involved in that thread personally, most involved. Um, and I guess there are two differences. One, so yeah, comparing like music versus uh, visual art and text. Um, uh, a very important technical difference between music and kind of everything else is that with music, for now, there just isn't as much like data out there that is. Um, Categorized in a way that like uh, models can be trained on effectively. Also, like lawyers are more influential in music than in like any other industry, and so like if you tried to do that, I think like record labels and like the trade organization would just like come for you immediately. Um, a lot of the development because of that, it's just harder to like train a music AI model, and so a lot of the groundbreaking work for now is like still happening in academia, kind of behind closed doors. But I think that will shift. Just give it like six months, I think it'll shift pretty dramatically. Um, visual art and text, all the innovation and like groundbreaking um, developments that are happening are like coming from the private sector or from like open source communities. It's like not academia at all. Um, as a result, there's a ton of VC money being poured into like the visual art and text side. Um, uh, Sarah, what you were saying earlier, like I think like at this point, hundreds of millions of dollars have have been poured into like text AI startups that are just for like generating soulful copy. Like it's a very like, that is not art, I guess we could debate that, but like it's a very like utilitarian view of like the role of generative AI and just like making tweets or writing emails, like that's the, that's what money's pouring into. Um, so that's one and the two. Uh, in music there's a huge difference um, between like how industrial scale models or in art in general, between how industrial scale models train, train on like terabytes of data, how that's being monetized and where artists like see themselves in that, and then like um, how artists are like training their own models as we kind of discussed and like monetizing that and like Web3 actually plays a huge role in that. It's just like, here's a model of my voice, like um, here's some output, would love for you to support me directly and like all that is happening via NFTs in terms of like how people are kind of, how artists are monetizing that and they have a lot more control and transparency over that in terms of who the top supporters of that art is. Um, hopefully that all made sense and it's funneled into kind of like question for everyone here as well. Like, so there are very different like levels at which AI experimentation and like monetization is happening. I think a lot of the fear mongering around the technology, um, understandably, is, is about like the corporate scale, industrial scale use of this technology and like artists like centralized platforms getting even more influence, artists losing even more leverage than what they have right now. At the same time, I feel like this group is actually pretty optimistic about the tech, because I think we're all engaging with it directly as like in our creative practice, we're using it as a search engine, we're using it to like access our subconscious, like that is like super fascinating to me. So I'm curious if, if, 
if anyone, in spite of the optimism, like if that fear of like what will happen at the industrial scale, if like anyone is thinking about that, or do you think like the optimistic impact of technology kind of outweighs that? I think there's I did research yeah. recently on um, like natural language processing, and I like spoke specifically on responsibility and ethics. And there was an example for um, it's like an AI rapper who was signed to um, a yes. record label. Yeah, um, I was just no. really concerned. <laughs> what? Um, so basically, they um, they generated an AI rapper based on Can we have asterisk AI. This yeah, is a huge but asterisk yeah, asterisk yeah. because they basically took this guy's voice and used it and then didn't compensate him, but they oh, trained wow. it off of like, you know, public content and I, I'm always like, I guess there's like inclusion in data sets, but it's inclusion in data sets that are dominated by, you know, capitalist and tricks, so they tend to be, um, you know, Western based or China, because that's where most of the money is coming from, and then it's also kind of like exploiting culture, which is like something that happens in like, you know, music and all arts all the time. So like that's like one of my concerns is like, you know, all these it can I don't know, you can like train things off of all these artists who spend a lot of time and effort like developing these identities and having this culture and then they're like kind of profiting off of it and just having kind of shitty practices. So yeah. Yeah. So, I mean I would add one thing to what you were saying, which is also like the, we have this thing we're looking at, we're calling it the hunt for TAM which is like the total addressable market for music AI tools is so, appears to be, we'll tell you how it shakes out, so much smaller than visual AI tools. And that really influences the amount of capital and resources. And another thing you say is, you know, the RIAs, the boogeyman, always looking around the corner, which also has curbed um, a lot of progress. And then in terms of like, quote unquote less optimistic takes, like I, I'm a researcher of water music, but I'm a producer songwriter for 15 years. Um, and that was the only way I support myself up until a year ago when I started working in water and music. And I have like different ways I monetize my skill as a producer. And I do believe that like some of my products, one of which is like podcast themes, that could be automated out. Like and like but in terms of working with an artist who uh, has a very specific message they want to deliver to the world and their fans care that they are saying it, I don't think that will be automated out. But there are definitely maybe ways, and like, to be honest, podcasting can be like my highest margin thing. So like, it would make doing the other work possibly more difficult if I all of a sudden couldn't monetize my skill in that way. Um, so that's something I'm thinking about. And when I learn about these tools, I try to think about how I'm going to position my skill set in business. There's something, like I feel like a lot of the sort of fear mongering, if we're going to call it that, around AI is like, especially in creative fields, is like this is going to wipe out the artist. And you hear a lot of conversations in music specifically of like, what if Spotify can start generating AI music and putting it on the platform, then what does that mean? But it totally, that, that line of questioning totally undermines how people consume music and also the business structure of Spotify. If that happened, the major labels would pull all of their content off of Spotify and Spotify would cease to exist. Like I think there's, a, there's so many like, uh, you know, it was capitalism all along, you know, like kind of that like lingers around all of these conversations and that like, but uh, you know, that aside, I think Nobody goes on Spotify to listen to like, uh, I mean, maybe they go on Spotify to listen to this like sweet baby dream time music in the ocean or whatever, you know, like these like really, really generic things. And like maybe that, like maybe people will listen to that to like fall asleep or in spas or in, you know, I, I've really noticed it recently. Um, I, I, I live in Portugal and I feel like somebody must have gone around to Portugal and said, you're not allowed to play Spotify in public places anymore because they, every restaurant is playing like terrible acoustic covers of like, oh, it, it drives me nuts. And like, that is actually a use case where like, I could see AI technology kind of taking over or, or sort of like what you're saying about uh, like creating music for podcasts, but that for like nobody, people still want to go on Spotify and listen to, to Dua Lipa or like, Kate LeBon or whoever, you know, like we were talking about it this morning, like today was like the Spotify rap day, if you haven't tried it yet. <laughs> um, uh, and 
it's interesting because you know I, I, I wonder how much of it, and it's an open question, I don't really know, how much is, uh, of it is actually based on how we are used to this myth of authorship and identify an author who is a person with a name and all kind of fetishization of this individual authorship. That we are, you know, I mean, so I'm talking a lot about the fact that we are witnessing this change, but that maybe in the future artworks will be made in a more kind of uh, crowdsourced manner, more collect collectively. But I'm not talking about like next year, I'm talking about maybe in a couple hundred years. And I just think that maybe this is a direction in which we could possibly be going, coming back to this origins of human culture where, yeah, like the Bible was written by, you know, over generations by, by thousands of anonymous people. Um, and uh, but 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 we, we still, although this may be a process that started, and we can see that Wikipedia is operating this way, and internet memes operate this way, but we are still very much um, accustomed to this idea of like a assigning value to things that have a name, author, and an identity behind it. Although there were, of course, all these music experiments with like uh, uh, hologram or, or you know artists, phantom phantom music artists, and some of them became. I, I'm, Blanking on the name, but there was one particular that was uh, female. Possibly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is a very interesting phenomenon, right? Uh, but, but it didn't really become something so viral that like everybody was because I and I think part of it is because we are still ha kind of hardwired over time, over centuries, for ha giving attention to all authors in any kind of creative discipline that are identified and they are individual or whatever, if it's a group or something. Uh, but I wonder how much of it is cultural and not because, because you know, you know, like this, this is what I'm kind of thinking about a lot. Like, what would happen if, an, like, you know, an artwork was crowdsourced among, I don't know, thousands of people, many artists that are very creative, or maybe not even non-artists, and then put up for, a, for an auction, you know, but it would be completely anonymous. I think that we are still living in societies that value so much this individual authorship that probably this artwork uh, you know, would uh, would not necessarily gain value, irregardless of its content. Yeah, it goes back to I think what you were saying in the beginning of that, like the audience sort of uh, the audience is part of the artwork and especially is part of like the value generation of, yes. of the artwork. And that if, when you there's there's really like reductive ways to think about the way that. AI is is changing creative practice, but we, it, it's reductive if, if you don't think about like the whole the whole value capture of that. Something else that I think is interesting is that it seems like we tend to get into this rut of thinking that you can use AI in like specific ways, and then you get you kind of get tunnel vision and you go down that direction. But it's like AI doesn't. When we're talking about music. It's not like we're just you know AI much more than just create a melody or, you know, there's so many um, applications for AI and music that have nothing to do with actually using AI to create something from scratch. Like, you can use AI to, uh, give examples, but like, if you know Image and Heaps music or something, yeah, you can mix and master. Like, I, um, I was just at a residency with this amazing um, woman named Kelly Snook, who is one of the creators of this thing called the Meepoo Glove, which is like a wearable that you can use that while you're speaking or singing you can actually you make your gestures become a way of shaping the sound and you can layer sound in real time and you like you become the mixer uh, like your body becomes a mixing board and it was just astonishing and she did a performance where she she read a poem actually she sang the poem and in real time turned it into something that was like so um, emotional like it just it, it was it was an amazing feat and it just to me that you know that's something that I've never really considered before because you know my mind usually just goes in the more obvious direction but there's so many other applications um, and I, I feel or like Holly Herndon's work for example like, I think is so brilliant as well so I feel I feel like again it's good to kind of get out of this rut of you know everybody uses text to image this way and like this is, <laughs> now now we all have to go down this path or everyone's using GPT-3 this way and, um, I think, again, like that's a good thing to push back against, and the more people understand the tools and how to use them, the more you can learn how to hack them, and the more you can learn about all the different possibilities. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in the music discussion. As a poet, like, I'm obviously very interested in spoken word, and in rhythm, and in intonation, and 
qualities of the human voice and how that affects how things are um, expressed and articulated. And actually, my studio partner is a musician and uh, a composer, and we've done a lot of work bringing um, music like, into the work that I'm doing with generative text. And just to bring it back to refraction, the, um, the, the piece that I'm actually um, featuring um, here is a generative music, generative poetry, generative visuals um, piece that really looks at how you can use um, the music algorithm to take maybe the seeds of, um, of something rhythmic and create many different songs. With the transhuman endeavor, though, it's like I've, you know, I've worked really hard on creating um, intersections of spoken word performance and then creating um, you know, music that really fits with that, but then using algorithm to bring it together in ways that are surprising or ways that might unveil things about the piece that I, you know, being a kind of a control freak, might not let it do. So kind of what you were saying before about using the algorithm, using it to surprise yourself, or find access things you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Like I think I, I'm particularly very interested in transhuman art, not like human versus AI. I'm really interested in how you know you can use both together and do things together that neither of you can do alone. So it's like you know my book of poetry, for example, like I couldn't have written it myself without the AI, but the AI can't write it without me either. And I think maybe that's like what I'm really interested in, whether it's poetry or music or visuals. It's like you know how can we how can we use AI as an augmented imagination and really um, take our creativity to the next level um, in that way. So conjoining rather than this or that. I really like that framing, like framing AI as a collaborator, and then also to that extent, kind of going back to what we were saying before about like pushing the boundaries of what's possible with these tools to embrace the glitches and to create like, new forms of creativity. And building on what you're saying, I just want to bring up uh, an example of how I saw an artist working with AI that really resonated with me. Also, going back to what you were saying about how sometimes output of AI can have this sort of like Western hold. Uh, there's an indigenous artist, um, she's indigenous American, her name is Suzanne Kite. And uh, she makes uh, experimental music and she also uh, creates these kind of like kinetic sculpture sound scapes. And she um, fed uh, GPT-2 uh, Lakota script, which is like the indigenous language that she speaks. And uh, the output was this like 20 minute kind of like experimental interactive art piece that she made with it where like GPT-2 just had absolutely no idea what to do with the Lakota script. And it was just like pure gibberish. And that was to me, it was like, wow. So it's such an incredible output and example of an artist working with AI to actually like create such a strong message about the tech as a musician. So that's awesome. Uh, one way that um, I've been using AI recently uh, with photography as my base. So as someone who's always generating the content of my work, um, I feel as though some things like Mid Journey and whatnot are almost a, such a baby stage, almost like clip art was when we first had computers. Because I feel like where it's sourcing is so messy. Like, what is it? What are what is the dimensions? What are the you're mixing like a million different web, super small items that mean nothing to anybody, um, for the most part. You know what will happen when we start really sourcing into things that we can grasp. Where you know um, archives of our whole lives. Now that we have our lives in phones for years and years of information, we know nothing of like how to even um, re revisit. You know, we don't even know how to revisit our photos of the past now, you know, because we've taken so many. So, like, how are we going to be using AI in a way to, like, um, dig deeper into contexts that we actually have, you know, understandings of and meaning behind, and, you know, and then what, where do you want to go with that? Um, but what I, what I do with it is I'm using it as, just as an up sample. Like, using, uh, right now I'm using photo photography AI, uh, just as an up sampler on my files so that if I take, I'm doing a moon language series where I'm dancing with the moon, I'm working with the moon, and I'm using a standard normal camera. 
because I'm using AI as an upsampler as my own telescope. So like I'm I'm changing, you know, we're we're like AI can do so many things that we don't even know yet. So like if we can use it like a telescope, what else can we do? You know, as an almost romantic idea of like a computer uh, collaborating with me in a way to fill in the details that we don't see. Or like you know, because our eyes are so change all the time and you know based on what we're thinking AI is doing the same thing in a, in a collaborative way to our future images so. because for me it's like this also this idea of like how uh, uh, AI um, allows for creation of a form in a network and you know of, of course the NFT is even kind of a uh, uh, blockchain is adding to, to to that and you know for example because I was working uh, already in an analog ways with collective intelligence and I see these algorithms not as a, a computer program I see them as a form of collective intelligence where all these millions of people ourselves included contributed so it's like working with you know the kind of the legacy of entire humanity or at least the kind of maybe caricature version of it that the corporations allowed to create for the moment but, uh, and I think that, you know, like conceptually is very interesting for me, but to think about it as a multitude or a polyphony of agencies that, that I'm using and not, not a program. Um, I often, oh, I was going to say, it's <laughs> super <laughs> fast, so I totally agree with that. And I, the, the analogy that like kind of sticks in my head a lot is just, you know, the, the experience that astronauts have, like when they go to the space, they look down at the Earth from afar, it's called the overview effect, and it's supposed to be this very profound experience. And to me, working with AI, Plugging into a large language model, I feel like I have an overview of humanity's you know, written record in some way that it, it feels that profound and it feels that um, different than any perspective I've ever been able to have. Perfect segue, actually, to what I was about to say. So, uh, also to what you're saying, and I think earlier you talked about um, something I really like, which is democratizing the healing power of art and giving people access to that. So. Um, uh, I came across this example on Twitter of someone, I think her name is Michelle Huang, who fine-tuned uh, GPT-3 on her, all of her old diary entries. Yes. So this was, I don't know if people have seen this. On what? Yeah. On her old diary entries? Oh, so, cool. from, so I think the initial goal or the idea is like, can I speak with this like abstracted version of my younger self and like how would... Like, could I like encourage her? Could she encourage me? Like, especially having a more optimistic view on the world. And I think it was, a, it was a pretty arduous process. Like, looking at the photos, like like ten different notebooks, which she had to like manually type everything. So it's a very arduous, like self-reflective process. But the result, like at least seeing the screenshots, and there's like a public Twitter vote about it. Like, um, I think it was very like healing and therapeutic. And so, um, just like yeah, highlighting those examples, and it's like a personal overview effect. Sure. And that's like, in, in interviewing a bunch of artists about these like AI tools and what it's like enabled for them, I think the most magical and inspiring examples come from when it just makes them know themselves better, um, and not in a way that like there's um, <coughs> fear, like oh, there's this other version of me. It's like, oh no, I can now interact with this other version of me, and like oh, there are like beats or like tendencies I never knew in my writing or in my like musical output. So like. Um, that's that's something I've like yeah also haven't like thought about personally but now like looking into more of these tools it's like um, spark what I'm thinking for me like what what from my history can I learn from now mm -hmm. in a way that's unique to this technology that like maybe uh, wasn't accessible to me before. So and that's amazing. Yeah. The investment of all of these companies that are um, trying to like create these opportunities for people when family members die. Yeah, sure. And yeah. Right? like it yeah. ties into, into that mm -hmm. where it's like catalogs and archives of our lives, connecting back to the of humanity, just feeding this like healing, sort of like basic human need to survive too. Yeah. It's, it's really that's, that's the power I think that we'll find in AI. Because right, you know, with the way cameras have, you know, changed, they're going more and more auto, more and more auto. It's like we're, we have a society of like automatic everything. And now they even have sensors that will do, you know, exposures for absolutely everything to make the most even boring image ever, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like now we have all these people making all of a, a million images that are all basically trying to meld into the same thing. 
So it's like, why do we want that? Why, why are we all like thinking that, oh, the future of art is just pressing a button and mixing everything? No. I feel like, you know, that's just a very, very small piece of the puzzle. Um, but we have to like understand how can we bring meaning to all of it because it's, uh, otherwise we're just going to end up more inundated on emails that we'll never read because there's already, you know, it's like if, if these corporations are putting all the money into writing emails, I mean, nobody's going to look at it anymore. You're never going to check an email in your life. Like, our kids won't, you know, it's like, I don't know. An assistant, it's just an AI system so will reply to an AI and, it's, oh and it's as even killed, as even killed as PC, you know, it won't offend anybody. It's like the most boring thing that nobody's going to listen to. So, you know, where are the, where are the sparks of our, of our humanity, you know, going to shine in those moments? Because everything's going to get really boring, you know, very soon. Because we're all just like mashing everything into the same, you know, same pot. I think there, there's two sides of it where I'm like on the language side, I think like the alphabet is finite and words and combinations are, you know, you could figure out what that number is and it's semi-finite, but you don't, I don't think like we're going to finish talking about being. And, and so, like, we're still, this is a thing we'll keep going at. And then, and then you have these, these large language models which are getting better at, like, exploring as, like, an ocean. Like, is that in the same way that the ocean is, you know, mostly undiscovered and then we're, like, submarining by, like, fine-tuning models. Um, and then there's this other aspect of, like, there's so many pixels in, like, uh, you know, or there's so much uh, light. Like, we're not inventing new eyes to see like new light technology uh, yeah so then not yet <laughs> yeah yeah but but then there could be more layering in in terms of like i make these images and now you're going to go through this physical experience or like you're going to get an email later talking to a bot so like the like i, I think of like an experiential like moving forward like you started a creative interaction and then it, it continues it's not just like the image you made or like, you know, the book, it, like there could totally be like a, a closer relationship to the artist or like the living collective or, or something like that. Yeah. Maybe that's like the spin-off of Water and Music, Ocean and AI. I like it. Oh. <laughs> that's the future. No, um, I want to make sure that we have time to kind of uh, work as a group here to identify some sort of like key takeaways or like a, areas of interest for like future conversations or research. I'm curious to know, Sherry, you were taking notes, Alex and Sarah, you were taking notes. Do you feel like there's kind of anything, I think you've been pretty like in, involved in the conversation, but have you, do you feel like you have any sort of like highlights, high level? I have many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious to hear you yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of what I was picking up on Almost all of you and a lot of people here use the word uh, democratization, you know, democracy. And uh, I think also, like, it's going back to how we're talking about AI as like a collaborator and not as like a threat and as a tool. Um, going back to what I was saying before, for me, what I've been hearing a lot is like kind of finding really specific ways to use the technology in considering all of its limitations and different ways of doing it. Creativity. Um, I also really liked what you were saying about how um, there are certain ways that we can use AI to like redistribute um, wealth and redistribute credits to artists as well. And I think that the parallels and the similarities between AI and Web3 have sort of yet to be kind of like defined because to me it seems like they're, they're two separate things but there actually are so many similarities and I think for future consideration that can be something that can be really kind of honed in on. Um, yeah, there's a lot here. I'm also, I also picked up a lot on like intention and purpose in using these tools. Uh, that seemed like a big thing um, for a lot of you and um, I think that also there's like intention and purpose that goes into creating art with these tools, but also that needs to be communicated with people that are also interacting with the art, which I think is interesting because I think that there's a lot of uh, 
hate towards AI art sometimes when we don't really understand the intent behind it. So I think that there's kind of like a two-way street there between creators and audience. So those are my main takeaways. But I've written like six pages of notes. <laughs> yeah. Alex, do you want to add to kind of? It's like six pages of blogging. Yeah. <laughs> this, like, and then I'll pose that like question to the wider group. Do you feel you like this? Do you all feel like is is there something that this like conversation has like sparked in you to you know go home and Google or like ask your friends about? I'm curious to know. About I'm, I'm getting like into this collective intelligence stuff more, where yeah. like the internet was doing that, and then now blockchain and AI, and so we're having more ways to like interconnect our relationship. But then we're still stuck in this individual myth of the hero or the whatever, like, and how will those two things play out where, because you're still an individual, you're not like, oh, I'm made out of, you know, I'm a million molecules or whatever, like, I, that, <laughs> we're still individual, and I think maybe that's why we're stuck on, you know, having to think of it in, in that way, but, but there could be a cool future where maybe we are, we do think of ourselves as like, I'm just a portion of Miami, or like, some other, like, relationship there. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the first question was about how are people going to make money for their art, and it just shows how, to the extent to which we're limited by our current like economic systems, and cultural biases, and imagining like what we can do with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, uh, oh, I share. Oh, no, 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 I was going to say um, I, I often like recommend reading T. S. Eliot's Tradition and Individual Talent, which has again nothing to do with AI, but everything to do with AI. Well, um, I feel like it's really relevant. Tradition and the individual talent. Yeah, it's something. Um, great to get a list of like some of the different projects y'all mentioned, like different artists, like as like a follow-up afterwards. Like you know, like hear the names of it. That would be great. Like anything else you need to all think of. Yeah, I think yeah. we're thinking about how to like publish. Uh, obviously, like the, we have some sound recording. It's not going to be like. Uh, as good as if we were like all, it's not like podcast quality, but we're hoping uh, to have something that we can share, even if it's, I feel like even sharing the notes would be really useful. And then we're kind of hoping to like develop perhaps like a research paper or some sort of like resource. Um, we kind of wanted to uh, see how these conversations went before we like projected what the, the kind of outcome would be. But yes, for sure. We have a database of music tools. People are interested. Yes, if anyone's interested in music, that said, so one of my main takeaways looking at my notes is that like the playing field isn't art, it's anyone who wants to express anything, which is <laughs> <Yeah>. everybody. <laughs> or, like, just hearing like how people are like using these tools, I think, um, um, was you said it's like activating a new communication tunnel like that's like what a lot of these tools are ultimately um, doing and like the self-knowledge um, that can like come from that or like new insights that can come from that regardless of whether we like label it as art with a capital A just thinking like the context of like this week like art fossil um, that was a huge takeaway for me and then this is um, I have written down like the value of the message. That's like come up again and again is like the most important thing. Um, I don't think it's anything new. Also, like in, in terms of like what like think about celebrity culture, fan culture, like what people are drawn to. It's like some sort of shared message or shared values. Um, and like I don't think creative AI changes that. I think what it might do is like distribute like who gets to control that message for like a given piece of art, just making it much more collaborative, networked. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but I have that written as well. So like, like where, where the human comes in and provides value to a piece of art where like the, the cost of generation essentially goes down to zero, it's kind of like personal meaning, social meaning, and multiple like layers of meaning we can get. Amazing. So I've tried on the fly synthesis over here. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, that being said, uh, does anybody, do any of y'all have any final words? What, one thing I wanted to say is Fabiola had a good question that I'm still thinking through, but it's like, how do you educate 
you know, the next generation and things like that. So either if you find, a, you know, like people in universities struggling with like using AI because the university is not allowing them or other situations where like my younger siblings, like we showed them AI and the first thing they said was like, this is where memes come from, right? And, <laughs> Whoa. And it's like, you, you can actually figure out what those, what is that relationship where we teach, but also they teach us by like not seeing the way we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if you had something to add about the education. Uh, well, it, it just, I thought about that question because it was very interesting that I am, uh, I am tutoring uh, students that are in PhDs and in college in Mexico, so I am very interested how they, like their teachers or they uh, reach out to me to see how can I help them in their creative process because the PhD uh, artist, she is a painter and she wanted to make like like her old, like all her work like through an AI to see if she can make, like so she can keep painting like the things that she paints that are portraits but just to like, like she says that she just needs something new that can help her to keep going in the, in the track that she is doing that. But also, I printed some lenticulars uh, from a, a gun that I made, and because it's difficult to like to apply to an exhibition, and they sometimes they don't have screens, so you have to send a tablet or something. So I just printed a bunch of lenticulars, and I was just like, okay, this is a 30 second video in 10 lenticulars, so I don't need like a like a, a, a screen to print a video like I, I really can't do it like that and so that's the thing that they have been like like learning and also my other younger students that, like they are like one girl was making like this TikTok project and she is creating now YouTubers on Dali so she can just like play with the idea and make TikToks with the people that she's making <laughs> in Dali so it's just like the way that I have been like trying to teach them or at, like tutoring them is just like it's new because that's they're not like they don't have that in, the, in their school and one friend of Moises he's in a school that like uh, they are not letting the students use AI to for their homework because that's cheating mm -hmm. so it's like that's that's the thing like how can you help uh, to teach uh, creativity and creation to younger generations if AI exists now, and how like how are you gonna guide the like the creative like the artists like the future artists? How are you gonna guide them in a way that they don't feel like they're cheating, and also that they can learn how to be creative without like those type of tools? And like that's that's the thing that just like I cannot stop. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, I think like education is like a huge part. Like I think in any conversation about technology but especially around like AI and Web3, like education is still just such a fundamental element of, of all the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, well, on that note, I think the music is, is starting <laughs> outside. Yeah. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we're going to take an hour long break. Uh, there's DJs playing outside uh, and then we're going to convene back here for another round table on uh, curation and AI. But thank you all thank so much for your time. Thank you.